On October 20th, 2022, after just 44 days in office, British Prime Minister Liz Truss resigned. I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Her brief premiership, the shortest in UK history, will be remembered for being marred by fiscal calamity, political infighting and market meltdown, but also for her dogged efforts to revive a controversial economic idea. That theory? Trickle-down economics, a term most commonly associated with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Truss's experiment was maybe a sort of last gasp of, of trickle-down. The disastrous results may have been the death knell for uh, that philosophy. Stock markets were roiled and the British pound plunged against the dollar after the new UK government unveiled a mini-budget of tax cuts seen to disproportionately benefit the wealthy, even as the country faces a worsening cost-of-living crisis. The move prompted critique from financial institutions and political ire from across the Atlantic. Even the Bank of England was forced to intervene. I think trickle-down economics is a bit of a boogie term uh, for people who dislike free market ideas. So just what is trickle-down economics and why did it cause the UK's economic strategy to implode? Trickle-down economics is the theory that deregulation and tax cuts at the top levels of society, namely for businesses and the wealthy, will eventually trickle down to benefit the population at large. Coined as a phrase by political opponents critical of top-level tax cuts, the term trickle-down falls within, but differs from, wider supply-side theory, which focuses on increasing the supply of labour and advocates lowering taxes for all. People who believe in the kind of trickle down about cutting taxes for the, the wealthy, for the entrepreneurs, their supply side story is that there will be such a strong response of new people founding firms, new, more Bill Gates, more Elon Musk's, because there's more of an incentive to come up with the ideas if you can get you know, bigger rewards for them. The idea is closely linked to the Laffer Curve, an economic model popularised in the 1970s by US economist Arthur Laffer, which showed the relationship between tax rates and tax revenue. According to the model, when taxes pass a certain level, they become counterproductive for increasing tax revenue. Crucially, that tipping point tended to come when taxes were prohibitively high, over 50%. He argued that if you cut taxes, um, for example, for the very wealthy, they pay for themselves. And the idea is that if uh, you cut taxes for the wealthy, they work so hard, they generate so much more growth and tax revenue, you actually end up with more tax. Trickle-down economics truly rose to fame in the 1980s under US President Ronald Reagan and UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who were both strong proponents of tax cuts as a way of spurring overall prosperity. Now, some critics complain your tax cut is too big, that it costs government too much. Well, this may be a shock to them, but that money isn't the government's to begin with. More recently, Donald Trump campaigned on the largest tax cut in the history of the United States of America. Meanwhile, in France, President Emmanuel Macron abolished the country's wealth tax in 2018 and joined the likes of Ireland in reducing corporation tax and deregulating industry in the name of growth. But trickle-down economics has come under harsh criticism over the years, with some political scientists dubbing it a zombie theory, an idea which has endured in public discourse despite long being disproven. In a 2015 paper, the International Monetary Fund noted that a rising income share of the top 20% results in lower growth. That is, when the rich get richer, benefits do not trickle down. If you look, say, over the last 30, 40 years, a lot of countries have reduced the tax rates on the most wealthy, the US in particular. That hasn't led to some sudden boom of growth. You know, the top 1% have got a lot, lot bigger shares of the pie. In the US, between 1979 and 2007, the net income of the top 1% of earners nearly tripled, while those in the bottom 20% rose by just 16%. The findings have been mirrored over the years in multiple reports. A 2020 study of five decades of tax cuts spanning 18 wealthy countries found that the effect of major tax cuts for the rich on real GDP per capita is close to zero and statistically insignificant. Still, in 2022, Liz Truss campaigned and came to power on promises of tax cuts, particularly for the top end of the economic spectrum. The UK government, for its part, has resisted the term trickle-down economics, instead referring to its economic growth plan as a series of supply-side reforms. Matthew Lesh is Head of Public Policy at London's Institute of Economic Affairs, 
a free market, right-leaning financial think tank that works closely with the UK's Conservative Party. I reject the characterization of trickle-down economics because I don't think that's a philosophy that anyone is doing or supports. I think that's a bit of a slur. What I would say is that the kind of policy the government's talking about in terms of boosting productivity, increasing economic growth, expanding the size of the pie, uh, and making it bigger so everyone can get a bigger piece. That policy agenda is very sensible and reasonable and, and something that I think can increase prosperity. And the challenge is making that politically palatable. That challenge, as it turned out, was entirely underestimated. In a September 2022 mini-budget, the UK's then Finance Minister Kwasi Kwarteng announced £45 billion worth of corporate and income tax cuts, including removing the cap on banker bonuses. Financial markets balked and sterling was sent into freefall. Britain's central bank, the Bank of England, was forced to step in with an emergency bond-buying operation to restore credibility to chaotic markets. Meanwhile, the unfunded tax cuts drew global criticism. In a rare statement, the International Monetary Fund said the plans would likely increase inequality and urged the government to re-evaluate the measures, especially those that benefit high-income earners. Days later, the Treasury was forced to U-turn on one of its most controversial policies of scrapping the top 45% rate of income tax for those earning over £150,000. It was the wrong thing to do. Within weeks, Kwarteng was given the boot, and with it, most of his economic policies were thrown out by successor Jeremy Hunt. There are going to be difficult decisions uh, in terms of public spending cuts, in terms of increases in taxation. The government strategy was considered particularly ill-timed, as the country faces its worst cost of living crisis in a generation, amid soaring inflation and higher energy costs. As of September 2022, UK inflation hit a 40-year high of 10.1% after dipping slightly in August. The Bank of England, alongside central banks across the globe, has been aggressively raising interest rates in a bid to cool the economy and bring down prices. Now, with inflation going up and interest rates going up, having big unfunded tax cuts is going to kind of throw fuel on the fire. It's like, you know, Liz Trust and Quasi Quarteng have got their foot on the kind of fiscal accelerator and the Bank of England has got its foot down on the brakes. That's not a good way to drive a car. <laughs> Of course, tax cuts are just one approach to economic policy. So what could be a better alternative which improves living standards and prosperity across the board? Professor Eric Beinhocker, founder at the Institute for New Economic Thinking, an Oxford-based public policy research centre, thinks he has a solution, something he calls middle-out economics. What does actually uh, increase long-term growth uh, are investments in the broad middle of the economy, in middle-income households, in their education, skills, uh, the infrastructure uh, that they use, and doing things that can increase their productivity uh, and, and wages over time. It's middle income households that do the bulk of the spending in the economy, and that spending then creates incentive, real incentives for businesses to invest in new products and services and innovation and grow. So you get this virtuous circle between uh, demand uh, and uh, innovation and, and growth. The theory has some high-level stakeholders, including US President Joe Biden, who made the policy a central tenet of his March 2022 State of the Union address. Build the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not from the top down. President Biden, who came from a, a working class background himself and spent much of his career you know, with working families and very committed to labor issues and so on, I think he intuitively kind of got the logic. And so his administration has actually been quite a dramatic uh, shift in direction. But as for the UK, it might be some time yet before it recovers from its economic experiment. For the average voter, uh, they want to know if their life is going to get better uh, over time. And so being able to show how these things go together in a positive way, that a more fair and inclusive society will also be longer term, a more productive and, and growing society, um, I think uh, is both has the benefit of being economically true and a very positive political narrative. The way ultimately to deal with this is to be able to get that economic growth um, in the medium to long term, which is through those supply side reforms. If you grow the economy, it means you can all have higher incomes. It'll be much easier to pay down the government debt as well as fund public services. And that's what's been lacking in the UK for the last decade. So I think the way to square the circle in the medium to long term is through that economic growth. In the, the short to medium term, I think it's very, very difficult, uh, both politically and economically. 